Well, thank you for coming today. Sure. Thank everybody else's vast audience for coming today. <laughs> Appreciate it. So yeah, your book sounds very interesting. And thank so you. I'll get a copy and we'll get you some publicity here. Oh, so thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah. I'm Camille Smalley. I wrote The Sacco Drive-In or Cinema Under the Main Sky. So my first plug is that my friend Charlie Wittes took all the photos for this book and he's an amazing photographer and he has a website if you're interested. That was part of our deal. I paid him in chocolate chip cookies to take the photographs <laughs> <laughs> and publicity. So does anybody hear about last year's Honda push to save drive-ins yes. and the big campaign that we had? Okay, great. So last summer was a monumental year for drive-ins across the country, including the Saco drive-in. 2014, this year, marks the end of the production of film. So last year, drive-ins needed to convert to di a digital format. Most drive-ins still run off of 35 millimeter or more film projection, which was great when, the f when it first opened, but now it's definitely becoming obsolete. Hollywood has decided they don't want to produce any films actually on film anymore, and that they were all digital. This means that drive-ins nationwide has to convert to digital. Now, it sounds simple, you just go to the store and buy a digital projector, except the projectors cost about $80,000. That's for the lowest model. So it's a very expensive endeavor for these amusements that are only open from May, maybe April, if we have a really good warm-up through September or October. Now, if you're a drive-in in, say, Texas or Georgia, you have much more even weather all year round and can be open much longer, as most of them are. Unfortunately for those of us in Maine, especially with this winter that we all remember too well, um, the drive-in didn't open until late April, and normally we try to open in early April. So there again, there's some revenue loss. So last year, we participated in this big project called Project Honda, which we actually approached Honda at the beginning of last year. We knew we had to convert to digital, and we thought, how are we going to do this? So Rye Russell, the manager of the drive-in, and Justin Shinnett, who's the Saco State representative, and myself, because we're all friends, got together and decided how are we going to fundraise and save one of Saco's biggest icons. So we thought, we have a great plan. We are going to approach the car dealerships on the Saco Auto Mile for sponsorships to save the drive-in. No our money down. <laughs> that's right. No money down, zero APR. So our plan was to offer them advertising. They put down, you know, $5,000. We can negotiate a package for their advertisements to run on the new digital projector. So we figured we could easily fundraise maybe $10,000 and then have five to seven auto dealerships sponsor the digital projector. Cars, you know, sales, it all goes together, right? We all got told, oh yeah, you have to talk to so-and-so, and funny, so-and-so never answered the phone. Yeah. So <laughs> that didn't work so well. <laughs> so what we ended up doing is we approached Honda, and they said, well, you know, this is a very interesting idea, we'll think about it. Well, after all the other answers, we thought, yeah, sure, you'll think about it like everybody else thinks about it. Then we got a call in July. Well, we've thought about it, and we've talked to some other drive-ins, and yes, this digital projector is a need, so we're going to run this contest called Project Honda to have people vote, the public, vote for the drive-ins that they want to win digital projectors. We thought, well, this is great. This is, you know, our golden egg, because we had had three fundraisers, and we raised about $5,000, which is... $75,000 short of a digital projector. So we filmed the Honda campaign at the drive-in and they filmed at a few other locations. We did a huge Facebook push. We had people voting every day. You could vote by text, you could vote by Facebook. It was a marathon all last summer. And part of the fundraising effort we thought was, well, we'll produce an ebook, and people can purchase the ebook, and that'll be part of our fundraisers. So I put out a call to the Saco Historical Society as well as people around town in different um, press releases and tried to spread the reach out and said, hey, if you have a memory of the Saco drive-in, please send it to me and it'll be included in this ebook that you could purchase. I think we put the price at $5 on Amazon and hopefully that would help us push us toward our goal. So as we're going, I get the ebook out. People really enjoyed it. And then it comes to be September when they're going to announce who won the digital projector. Well, it was a nail biter and they decided they were going to announce one winner over the next 10 days, which is the most painful thing I've ever experienced. <laughs> I had talked to myself in the mirror in the morning and said, you're not going to win and it's going to be fine. Even though you put your whole lifeblood this summer into this, it'll be okay. 
So I go to work at the Saco Museum and I'm at work and I get a phone call from Rye Russell, the manager of the drive-in. And he says, Camille, I just heard from Honda and we won. And I was like, Rai, you're kind of a prankster. Are you sure? Like, are you sure it was Honda and not like someone calling you and saying they're Honda? And he was like, no, we won. And so he had to convince me. And then I started crying and then he started crying and we're all crying on the phone. And we decided that we were going to have a party that evening to celebrate the drive-in winning the digital projector. So after all of that press, because we got press from Boston News, Portland News, and actually even as far as Virginia for winning the digital projector, which is amazing. Things from Saco rarely trickle out past Portsmouth. My so <laughs> getting Boston news was great. And then a few days later, I get an email from Rye that's a forward from someone else, and I open it, and it's The History Press asking me if I wanted to write a book about the history of the drive-in. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is great. And so I emailed her back and said, sure, I've already written an ebook." <laughs> so they looked at the ebook and they said, oh, this is great. It's a great 6,000 word narrative. I want it to be 33,000 words. <laughs> well, as I previously mentioned last winter already, it's a good thing it was so cold so I could stay in and write instead of wanting to go out and do things. So it was, it was a good experience um, writing the book. What I did was, is because it starts off, the ebook started off with the history and then went into people's stories. So what I did was I expanded the original concept to include Saco history from pretty much the point of contact of people coming here and starting a fishing village. And then I followed the way that transportation had changed. So I kind of chronicled the development of roads, how we started to have roads, and how the Saco auto mile kind of developed around the drive-in, the history of drive-ins, kind of 30s, 40s culture, and then I have people who submitted their memories, and I talk about those. And I actually, through this process, got to meet some really interesting people. One of the people I got to meet was a gentleman who worked as an usher at the drive-in. His name is Don Whittem. He worked there from 1945 on. He had returned from war and decided to work at the drive-in. So I got some really good information from him, and I'll read his story in a minute. So the theater opened in July of 1939 with a comedy starring June Clyde and Jimmy Durant. Then admission was only 35 cents a person. Now it's $15 a car. So I think the amount is about the same reasonably, 35 cents a person then versus $15 a car now. So it's still a really affordable amusement. The theater was advertised as a place to enjoy the talkies and watch a movie from the privacy of your own car. The theater gained popularity opening in, the Ju in June through the summer season and it closed in October. In 1942, the theater went dark as the government issued blackout curtains. I figured they didn't want the Germans to be circling watching the end of the movie before they made their wartime decisions. However, even though the theater went dark, it promptly reopened the next summer. As I mentioned, I met with Don Whitham and I will read you his which was probably my favorite. He still lives right next to the drive-in. Um, I met with him at his house. He was the sweetest old man. He's about 90 years old. After I interviewed him, he said, you're going to write no these notes down, right? Because I, I'm probably just going to talk. And I said, that's fine. I, I will write your notes and I will turn them into the narrative that um, it should be. And he's like, okay, good, because I can't write all this down. It's just going to come out. <laughs> like, that's fine. And he sweetly patted me on the shoulder and told me he was so glad to have met me and talked to me that day. So it was just, it was a very fun experience. So this is Don Whittem, a former Saco drive-in usher. I was born in Dunstan, Scarborough, and remember going to the drive-in when it first opened in 1939. I rode my bike with some friends from Scarborough to Saco, and the ticket man said I was too young for the film. I was the head usher at the drive-in from 1946 through 1956. After World War II, I came home and Mr. O'Neill, one of the owners, along with Eugene Borogene, asked me if I wanted to work at the drive-in. I said yes, and the Borogenes specifically were very nice people. Eugene Borogene was a happy-go-lucky man who really enjoyed having families and children at the drive-in. He really focused on the drive-in playing family movies, and he actually knew someone in the film business to get those first-run films. That summer in 1946, I met my wife, Jean, she was working as a ticket taker in the ticket booth at the drive-in, and we were married that fall for 43 years until her death. 
1946 until about 1947, the Sacco Drive-In had only one large speaker on top of the screen. It blared so loud that the people all the way down to Pine Point could hear the sound. <laughs> people often complained about the noise from the theater, but no one ever actually did anything about it. When the individual speakers came along, I placed them on the cars and also fixed them when anything was wrong. Sometimes, I helped in the projection room with the two projectors that ran on carbons. They took up the entire room together. You had to unwind the film reels and watch carefully to prevent a break in the film. When the film broke, you used special cells to piece it back together. Of course, at times, bugs came in and got stuck on the glass and skipped the film. <laughs> in the early days, the capacity was 125 cars. After the theater switched to individual car speakers, the space, was a, the space without the large speaker made room for more cars, bumping the drive-in up to 300 cars. A stockade fence was added after the loudspeaker was removed. About 1954, a new panoramic screen was installed. In the late 1940s, the drive-in sold hot dogs from the ticket booth, and you didn't even have to buy a ticket to buy a hot dog. Then, later, there were two concession stands, one behind the projection room, which is still there, and one to the far right upon entering the theater, and the building is still there. Both stands stole hot dogs, ice cream, hamburgers, soda, and coffee. The playground was off to the right and had slides and swings for the kids. We had many popular films at the Sacco Drive-In back in the 40s and 50s. I remember we had The Greatest Show on Earth play in 1956 or 1957 from dusk till dawn. The drive-in was packed. This movie came out in about 1952 with Charlton Heston, Jimmy Stewart, and Betty Hutton. Everyone loved it. We also had Cecil A. Moore, known as Mush Moore, come and talk about his adventures about running a dog sled race from Lewiston to Alaska. Many people enjoyed the Sacco Drive-In in those days. And having speakers come to the drive-in was something a lot of other drive-ins also did. It was another way to bring people in and try to make more money. Even though the film, in, when they were printing on film, it was hard for drive-ins to get first-run films. A lot of times they played movies on their third run or their fifth run. And they were often two years old. So it was really hard to get first-run films. It was really special for the Sacco drive-in to actually be able to play more current films. The second film was often a later film. They also had um, various things come to the drive-in like talent shows and things like that just to try to get people excited and like I said make more money so they can afford better films. Um, a few different drive-ins like one in New Jersey actually had a place where you can fly your airplane in and land and watch <laughs> the movie. Of course that didn't happen in Saco much. <laughs> So next to the Sacco Drive-In, I don't know if anybody remembers, but the Cascades Inn and their big shore dinners. So that was on the corner. Of course, now it's kind of a strange strip mall and a, a beverage redemption or something. Yeah. Um, so that was, of course, right next to the Drive-In, which the Drive-In very much benefited from being located so close to Old Orchard Beach, which it still does. So when Eugene Borgin, who is the most known owner of the Drive-In, he also named the drive-in the Motor Inn Theater and the Sacco Motor Inn Theater before he called it the Sacco Drive-In. He was an Italian immigrant transplanted from New York and he owned the theater with his wife Helen. One of my favorite parts of this, um, the drive-in history is that Eugene Borgin, one of the original owners, was an Italian immigrant. He was a house painter in New York according to the, the census records. I would love to go back in time in my TARDIS and ask him why did you move to Maine and open a theater when you were a house painter? <laughs> I haven't quite been able to figure that out. But inside the drive-in, in some of the photos in the book that I received, he actually painted a mural that's on the inside of the concession stand. It's been painted over since, unfortunately. But in the book, you can see big palm trees and just that he was very talented. So um, that's kind of something that I think is one of those kind of like American dream kind of stories that shows that the drive-in is really an American invention. So Borodin, like I mentioned, he didn't mind having families and children at the drive-in. And with Cascades being next door, of course a lot of families would come. Well, Cascades had a large wait staff, and a lot of times uh, the, the wait staff would work the late night shift and then have to open in the morning. So they had dorms on site at Cascades for the wait staff to live in, which always makes me think of the movie Dirty Dancing. <laughs> so, with the dorms being there, even if you lived on Flag Pond Road, which isn't that far, going at night home and then coming back early in the morning is a lot for, you know, a teenager. So they'd often sleep over. 
So I was told a little story that sometimes they would sleep over and then sneak over to the drive-in. So I got this story from um, actually the, so the development officer at the soccer museum, Nancy Tripp, her sister, um, used to do this. I worked at Cascades Restaurant while I was in my late teens during the summers in the 1950s. I worked a variety of shifts, sometimes closing one evening and opening for breakfast the next morning. Cascades had dormitories for servers, particularly in that situation. I had several friends who did not live very far from Cascades or from the Saco Drive-In, but when you work those back-to-back -back closing and opening shifts, even going three miles seems to be too much. After closing up in the evening, a group of us would climb through the shrubs and watch films at the Saco Drive-In without actually going into the drive-in. We couldn't hear the movie, but it was free and a great way to blow off steam after work. <laughs> Which, who can argue with that? I suppose most of us that go to the gym, you can't really hear the TV anyway, but we know what's going on. It's still entertaining. So families have enjoyed the Saco Drive-In for 75 years. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the Saco Drive-In, which is incredible for a small, family-owned, always family-owned business in Maine, which is um, definitely something to celebrate. So I'm gonna read to you some of my favorite stories um, that people submitted to me from the drive-in. So this story is from Alexis Moody, who's from Scarborough, Maine. There is nothing like packing up a cooler, bringing some blankets, the comfortable lawn chairs with the cup holders, and watching a movie at the Saco drive-in. For my family, this is something that happens every summer and multiple times per season. Money is tight for us and it has been a while, but thanks to the great prices of the Saco Drive-In, we can take all three of our kids out to enjoy two movies for the matinee prices of two adults' tickets at a regular theater. Not counting food. I don't know how the Saco Drive-In is able to do this, but I am grateful. Our family enjoys time outdoors with great film together. Last season, we went and saw Monsters University, and the entire drive-in was packed. I think they sold out that weekend. I can't recall the second film, but there were so many families' laughter and smiles. And that's something that keeps Rye Russell running the drive-in, is having a place where all these families can come and enjoy movies together. And the fact that it's still 75 years later is such a good family atmosphere. I think it speaks to kind of our culture about families and being together and spending time together being important. So this story I really appreciated when it came in because when I think of drive-ins, I think of horror cheesy movies that they showed at drive-ins, especially in the 60s because you know they weren't getting as good of films then and of course drive-ins started closing in the 70s and then in the 1980s um, they often showed adult films mm -hmm. as I have had many um, people, vo different volunteers at the Sockwell Museum say to me, that place showed dirty films. <laughs> and I just had to like hold back a giggle because it was so funny the way they would say it to me. Um, so we're really lucky that the Saco Drive-In made it through those really lean times and has been able to show modern films and then family films again. So this memory kind of speaks to that 1970s, 1960s horror kind of gory films that they showed at the drive-in. This is from Constance Downs and she didn't give me a location. I went to the Saco Drive-In with my boyfriend quite often in the early 1970s. My mother thought I was going with a group of girlfriends, but she never knew that I was actually meeting up with my boyfriend at the drive-in. I'm sure she'd be horrified to know that now. <laughs> I remember seeing films like Night of the Living Dead, House on Haunted Hill, Last House on the Left, and other incredibly gory films. Most people I know who went to the drive-in enjoyed those films too, well, when they were paying attention. By then, there were not as many families at the theater as there had been when I was a child. It was more those of us teenagers who have had a newfound freedom with the car. I think the drive-ins gave us freedom to just be and experience life on our own. Which I think that's also true. Another piece of the drive-in history is this kind of movement from being so family-centric to being a place where, you know, kind of a safe place for teenagers to go. And then, of course, coming back around to being more of a family place like it is now. Of course, they try to play a more variety of films with having a kids movie first and then more of a 
you know, late teens adult movie second so that way families can leave if they want to or, you know, the kids fall asleep in the car and so then you can watch the adult movie and take them home and put them to bed in their pajamas. <laughs> Which was also a story I got a lot from different people was I remember taking the kids to the drive-in in their pajamas and carrying them home. And it's funny because spending nights at the drive-in last summer, various times this summer, I still see kids playing in their pajamas and playing catch and having cookouts and it's very cyclical, this whole notion of, you know, the drive-in being this, this great place. And that it has, the best part to me is that it has nostalgia and history, but it's still current. It's still a place you want to go, and it's still a place you want to bring your family. So, the book has more stories and uh, more history, but do you have any questions? I totally relate to the, the, the 50s going to the yeah, Portland Drive-In. Drive yeah. That was a date type thing, so yeah. Me too. But yeah. in recent years, <laughs> Not with you. <laughs> in recent years, my grandsons, well, this is going to be 10 years ago, they live out of state because they had never been to a drive mm. so it was a whole new concept for them. So I took them to the Pride's Corner, which is closest to me. Yep. They had no idea what it was. They said, oh, we're going to the drive-in movie, and, they lived. and, mm. and it was two feature films, and I thought, well, they, they were older, but I thought they'll watch the first yeah. film and then fall asleep. Yeah. Never happened. <laughs> they were wide awake for both things. Oh, I yeah. didn't get home till after midnight, and I was beat. But, <laughs> but that was whenever they came to visit me from out of state. That was what we scheduled with the trip oh, to yeah. the drive -in for the the trip to the drive -in. Many memories of the drive -in. I'm a recent neighbor, so I don't remember this place at all or any of these others. Mm -hmm. But um, Long Island, New York, is where I grew up. Mm -hmm. We had drive-ins there, yeah. and some of these things you're saying. Totally the same thing. Mm -hmm. Had a playground, had concession mm -hmm. stands, and I can remember the the concession stand ads that you uh, yeah. had yep, the, on the top first. The dancing with the, with, with the popcorn. moving dancing yep. pop, yeah. popcorn thing. And uh, my mom would put my brothers in their pajamas before we went because mm -hmm. they would fall asleep in the back seat of the car and, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, the drive-in actually originated in New York, or I mean in New Jersey, yeah. is where the first drive-in opened. And then after that, it just became very formulaic and everywhere had a drive-in. Mm -hmm. In the back of the book, I actually have an appendix of all the drive-ins that were in Maine. Almost every single town had a drive-in. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Kennebunk, yeah. Sanford, you know, right. Biddeford didn't, but they're just everywhere. There's still one in Bridgeton, right? Yep, yeah. there's, still, there's five active ones in Maine still. Wow. We have the Saco drive-in, we have the Pride's right. Corner Drive-In, the Bridgeton Drive-In, the Skowhegan Drive-In, and the Madawaska Drive-In. Oh, wow. <laughs> and the funny thing is that the Madawaska Drive-In opened in 1972. Oh, wow. Which is as, of wow. course, drive-ins are closing, Madawaska yeah. goes, hey, we have a great drive-in. Yeah. What so, did the Pullman Drive-In open? Do you know um, I, can, I can look. It's and in I my appendix. Copy that book. Yeah, so. So you all well, be on check it out here. I don't have one. I don't have any with me because my dad bought all of my drive-in books. <laughs> because he insisted on it. But if you buy them, I will gladly come sign them for you. So the Portland Twin Drive-in opened in 1949. So that was only 10 years after the Saco Drive-in. And the Saco Drive-in was the first drive-in in Maine and the second in New England, beat out only by Weymouth, Massachusetts by a couple of years. How many different people have owned it during its history? Supposedly, the first owner, the first, there was a co-owner in the beginning, yeah. and then Eugene Borgen came and there was three of them. From most of the older people I've spoken to that worked at the drive-in, there was a Mr. O'Neill, a Mr. Borgen, and another guy who wasn't very nice, who only <laughs> came in once a week. I've only heard of this other guy as being the guy who wasn't very nice, so I'm assuming he must have been the financial guy. <laughs> And then Boragine bought them out and owned it outright, and then he sold it, and it was owned by the person who owned also the Scarborough Drive-In. So that, I think it was the Hoyt Cinemas, they owned both of those, and then it's currently owned by the Roberge family of Roberge Construction in Biddeford. Mm -hmm. So it's really only had a few. When I was looking for business records to try to track that, I actually emailed the city of Saco, and they said, oh, we don't actually have to keep those for longer than five years. So it became a little difficult to try to figure that out. Yeah. Is your book selling well? It is. It's doing pretty well. I haven't gotten a commission check yet, but I'm sure that's in the mail. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.